What the Navajos are doing to protect their own heritage also protects our heritage. Preserving a diversity of uses and protecting culture and nature in Utah. They're probably the most unknown piece of mountain in the state, and there's no telling what we'll find. A mountain range in New Mexico so remote and rugged, few people even know it's there. He's just getting a roller coaster ride straight down. Why this special excursion for some California fish? It's an ingenious device to protect some deep sea dwellers. She does perform essentially like she is in a game show. No kidding, a game show for snakes? These reptiles are speedy and scary smart. We'll strike out in some exciting new directions right now on This American Land. Funding for This American Land provided by the Weiss Foundation, the Pew Charitable Trust, and the Turner Foundation. Hello and welcome to This American Land. I'm Caroline Ravel. And I'm Bruce Burkhart with some great stories about people dedicated to the conservation of America's natural resources, its landscapes, waters, and wildlife. Today we start in Utah where the Navajo Nation has proposed a national conservation area to protect a historic land that is part of their ancient heritage, but outside the Navajo Reservation, a place that's important to all of us. The Navajo, the land of the Navajo. Our people believe that they came from the ground and we live in the fourth world. The environment, the land, Mother Earth sustains human being. It's food, medicine, a place of worship. It's heaven on earth. As Native Americans, in our heart, in our soul, we believe that the land belongs to us. Cedar Mesa is undoubtedly one of the most uh, incredibly important archaeological sites in America. It is chock-a-block with cliff dwellings, rock art, uh, granaries, kivas, and what makes it particularly unique for all of its significance is entirely unprotected by federal designation. These were the first Americans who lived here thousands of years ago, and particularly in the last millennium, where they left signs all over the place. And we need to preserve these in order to understand who these first Americans were, what they were doing, what were they all about? This is very typical of alcove sites on Cedar Mesa. There are many, many of these. This is a late period site. You're probably looking at oh, 1050 to about 1250 AD, somewhere in there. There is rock art at this site that's much earlier than the structures that you see. There's rock art at, at this site that is uh, older than the structures that you see here. So you get multiple occupations over time of sites like this. This is uh, a midden or an ancient trash mound of a Pueblo site that probably dated from about 1050 to the late 1200s. This is a Navajo sweat lodge, and you're probably looking at the early part of the last century. This is a basket maker storage cyst, probably somewhere between zero and 750 AD for this site. So between the sweat lodge over here and this site, you're looking at about 1200 years of history. And you're looking north across Cedar Mesa, and in the distance, those two buttes are bear's ears. Almost everything you're looking at here is Bureau of Land Management. We say that this is our stronghold, a place where our great leader, Chief Manuelito, was born. And even today, it's a very important area to the Navajo Nation, which is directly south of Cedar Mesa. 
and also Pueblo Indians that have a lot of their ancestral ties to cultural ties and religious ties to Cedar Mesa. That's what I hear from the elders all the time. They lost a lot of things that meant something to them, that sustained their lives. You go out there and they say no chopping, no hauling, no trespassing. We have to pray kind of fast and be aware of certain individual coming up on us and we can't be at ease. Way back, we used to uh, move around and we used to go and live wherever we needed to, but now it's not that way because of the law that are in place. In the Treaty of 1868, they said, those will be forever, not anymore. That's a promise that is broken. Its resources, its cultural sites are at risk increasingly through greater visitation, sometimes looting, off-road vehicles, oil and gas drilling. There's a lot of vandalism of cultural resources that has taken place over the years, and to have that kind of area subjected to a lack of protection is really a problem. These are wood cutting intrusions where people are just uh, illegally driving off the road to cut wood or collect plants. Uh, there's lots of wood, lots of wood. It's dead trees only, although there are permits for fence posts, and those are usually live trees, but they're not supposed to drive off the road like this. So if you multiply these intrusions by about a thousand on Cedar Mesa, the, you, know, you kind of get an idea of the impact of this. Now there's usually a lot of trash associated with these sites. Beer cans, oil cans, diapers. The Bureau of Land Management is responsible for law enforcement in this area and has very limited resources to address the problem. Um, a lot of the problem is basically lack of knowledge. Folks that have traditionally cut wood in this area don't realize that what they're doing may be causing problems to uh, resources that are out there. As a Native American, it's really sad and it's really frustrating to beg the county, the state, and the federal government to create a conservation area. The Navajo, through the Denea Bakea organization, are looking for certainty in the management of these lands. They want to be able to be assured that they can access these lands for their medicinal plants, for the use of the sacred sites that are up in this area. Don't have to go to the drugstore. You can rely on natural stuff. The juice off of here is very tasty. It tastes like uh, the green tea. You can smell it and, man, it's strong. The Dene Bakea proposal consists of Cedar Mesa area at its core with a large expanse of Red Rock country to the west, northwest, and then forest lands to the north of that. Most of the area is federal lands. However, there are state lands within the area as well. Creation of a national conservation area is not a short or easy process. It takes a long time to get consensus, and oftentimes you can't, between the users of the land, the people that care so much about it, the agencies that manage the area, the private landowners. Bringing those folks together to come to some common ground and then being able to take that forward to Congress is a long, long process. And done right, um, it can be very successful, but it takes a lot of time. We hope to see a continuing practice of the Navajo traditional ways of life. What the Navajos are doing to protect their own heritage also protects our heritage, and that's why we all need to work together to make this happen. Aboriginally, this is our home. Our ancestors, our grandfathers, lived there. The Navajo have taken the lead in this effort, and they're doing it in their own interests, but they're doing it for all of us as well. For our next story, we go to a place known by few people, the remote and rugged southeastern corner of New Mexico, right on the Texas border. A mountain range where some scientists believe they'll make important discoveries someday, if the area can be protected as wilderness. It's not far from the spectacular Carlsbad Caverns National Park. 
<laughs> I got it. No, nope, this is a new bird. Yay, yay. Okay. We have a new bird. Yay. Oh, the birds that we're banding here are cave swallows. If you're managing a species, one of the things you need to know is where do they breed, and where do they winter, and, and what's the area they go between the two. My name is Steve West, and I'm the staff scientist for the New Mexico Wilderness Alliance. One of the things I've been interested in for over 30 years, of course, is the swallow banding, and uh, that, that brings up a connection with caves, and I often wonder what are the Brokoffs all about. This road forms the eastern boundary of the wilderness study area, and this is our wilderness proposal over here at La Paloma Canyon. The Brokoff Mountains are a range of mountains in southeastern New Mexico. Lincoln National Forest, Carlsbad Caverns National Park, and Guadalupe Mountains National Park are all part of that. Starting from the bottom down there, all the way up to that top line, there are more caves and rock shelters than I could count. The Brokoffs are part of a wilderness study area. They've already done about half of it, and our concern is the other half of those mountains. My name is Dan LeClaire. I'm a retired teacher, and I live in Carlsbad, New Mexico. Absolutely. Oh, God. We believe that all of the Brokaw should be in that wilderness study area. And if you think we've seen some wild canyons so far, just take a little hike along this ridge sometime, and you'll see what the best definition of a wild canyon is. They're probably the most unknown piece of mountain in the state of New Mexico, and there's no telling what we'll find. The wildlife you'll see out there, the Great Canyons. Probably one of the last areas in southeast New Mexico and this part of Texas that looks the way it looked 150 years ago. My name is Will Law. I'm a licensed professional clinical counselor in Carlsbad, New Mexico. Coming from Florida to New Mexico, I was startled because I came from a place of large flowers, big trees, lots of big wildlife. And it took me a long time to understand that everything here is small. The smallest bug, the smallest flower, snakes. You really have to develop an eye to see this. I think what a lot of people see when they come here is a big empty wasteland. It's not an empty wasteland. It's actually a very fragile environment. It takes hundreds of years for this to recover from any damage that we do. If you fly into El Paso, you would notice that on both sides of the road, there are huge quarries. And what were, when I was a child, were great mountains, are now molehills. And I can see that same sort of thing being done with the Brokaws. The Brokoffs have water courses that are pristine and that haven't been impacted yet. And I think there's a high risk of this area, if it doesn't become a, a wilderness area, being developed by the oil industry. My name's Judy Kalman. I'm the staff attorney for the New Mexico Wilderness Alliance in Albuquerque, New Mexico. If an area is not administratively or congressionally protected, it's open to grazing, it's open to mining claims, it's open to oil and gas leasing, and it would be open to off-highway vehicle use. This is not to say that people shouldn't use public land because public land is there for the public and we own it. But if there is something special about a piece of land, the BLM should make sure that when humans go in and use the piece of public land that they're not harming that value. And then back up in this canyon from that point down there. Right. Gives you another perspective on the caves and rock shelters. Most of the Brokoffs are owned by the Bureau of Land Management. There is some state land, a little bit of private land, but the overwhelming majority is, uh, is public land. If you're a potato farmer in Maine and you've never been west of the Mississippi, you own this land just as much as somebody who's ranching it right now. There's so many misconceptions about the Wilderness Act. I've usually got a copy of it in my car so that if I'm out in the field and run into somebody and they say something, I'll pull it out and say, well, actually, this is what it says. Last time we were out there, I talked to a certain rancher whose family had been on the land for 103 years. That's the sort of thing we're trying to preserve does not involve confiscation of land. It does not involve removal of cattle. It doesn't take anything away from anybody. Anything that you can do in the Brokoffs right now, you'll still be able to do when it's wilderness. I do think that the Brokoffs merit Lands of Wilderness Characteristics designation. All of our studies have indicated that it's ecologically very special. This is gr a great land here. The, the only problem with it is there's so much to do. 
if you're really into mountain climbing. It's a turkey vulture, Dan. If you are a hiker with a, an extreme sense of adventure, the Brokoffs are the place to be. It's breathtaking, truly breathtaking. And now to the West Coast, where scientists are testing a new device to ensure the survival of unwanted fish that are caught by sport fishermen. Fish brought up from deep water often fail to survive due to internal organ damage caused by pressure change. We sent our crew to San Diego to find out more about how this device works. Okay, folks, we're in a very good spot. This will be Ken's fishing hole. So we got real nice marks underneath the boat. We're actually using slabs of other rockfish. Go ahead and drop Lighter on the starboard side. Thank you. Good job, look at that. Erica. Wow. <laughs> look out the window real quick. Swing your camera. Good job, Justin. Um, 71 5. Feels good. We get this fish back in the water. Nice fish. He's just getting a roller coaster ride straight down. Just mouth open, as you can imagine, like a roller coaster. Ah! Gotcha. Got you. What was that good bait I gave you, huh? Nice red. Yeah. Yeah, buddy. Is this really a research trip, or is it just an excuse to come out fishing? Don't tell anybody. This is a horrible job. <laughs> <laughs> We are standing here on a dock in uh, San Diego. Yeah, I'll get it. Right. We're going out on a fishing trip, if you like, but it's not really a fishing trip as we tend to think of it. My name is Mike Osmond, and I work for World Wildlife Fund, the fisheries program. So this is our study site. It's an underwater plateau, and it's about 40 miles or 70 kilometers off the coast of San Diego. Flat lines there. We're going out with some scientists from NOAA, representatives from the California Sport Fishing Association, and the whole purpose of this trip is to look at how we might utilize science and the participation of the fishing community to address the issue of barotrauma. OK, we're really on top of a nice spot of fish right now. The process that causes barotrauma in these fish, they've got a, a contained bladder of air inside of them called the swim bladder. He's got Popeye, he's got ocular emphysema. Which As it terrible. comes to the surface, the pressure changes and leaks gas into the rest of the body, which eventually makes its way to the eyes, to the stomach, and pushes various parts of the body out. I'm John Hyde. I'm with uh, NOAA Fisheries Service, Southwest Fisheries Science Center in La Jolla. These guys come up in pretty bad condition. So we'll just take a, a quick DNA sample. And so the quicker that we can reverse this, the quicker that we can alleviate the problems. We've caught a couple of bocaccio, and we caught a starry rockfish. Bycatch is the unintentional catch of species that you are not targeting. But we still haven't caught, obviously, our target species, which is cow cod. So we try to get the fish back in the water, get them recompressed. He's in. And that's where the sequelizer comes in. And that's where the sequelizer comes in. The sequelizer is a great device in that it has a much stronger grip than a lot of other recompression devices. The chance of a fish falling off of it are greatly reduced, and it takes a lot of the thought out of the process. You've got set depths that you can choose, and it will release at 50 or 100 or 150 feet, whichever you choose. Can you just clip and close? The pressure activated clamp. World Wildlife Fund started the uh, International Smart Gear Competition as a way of looking for innovative solutions to address the problem of bycatch. Sweet. The sequelizer came from a fisherman and his son who are based in Florida. His name is Bill Brown. And uh, they developed this pressure activated device in their garage. The some of the species of rockfish have been aged to over 200 years old. Um, in Southern California, many of our species tend to be shorter lived, but 50, 60, 70 years is not an unheard of maximum life. 
I think I got a big Where's your miles? Rockfish have been a, a difficult group to manage as a whole. Typically, when they come up from greater depths, they're unable to be released easily. They float at the surface, and they are essentially left to die or get eaten by other predators. I'm just going to push them over to you. You know, most fishermen I know feel bad when you see a fish you brought up and it's floating on the surface. You know, you tend to feel even worse if it's a big fish that you feel it's, you know, 50 year old cow cod. It, you got to give some something for its life. Because of that one fish, they've closed huge areas of the ocean. All right, you guys, go on, let him go here. In Southern California, the value of the sport fishing industries is a little over $2 billion. My name's Ken Frankie. I'm president of the Sport Fishing Association of California. Having access to the ocean is uh, real important for us to keep, you know, that business thriving and well. Uh, they came up with a device called the Sequelizer. Okay, they got a cow cod. Got about a 12-pound cow cod that they just caught. Now that transmitter they're putting on there, um, they'll be able to actually track that with the receivers. We have transmitter receivers, 17 of them on the seafloor here. We got our tag on there. The goal right now is to try and rebuild that stock as quickly as we can. Each fish during its lifetime could represent millions of smaller fish at a later date. So every fish that we save is actually exponential because they'll have babies called recruitment, and then their recruitment will have babies. So uh, in the long run, uh, you know, one fish really makes a big difference. If you can convince enough people to use these descending devices, then not only are you conserving the resource, but the concern about closing the fishery is not as uh, severe. Nice cow. There what we're experiencing here is uh, a growing practice of cooperation and collaboration out in the ocean, where the fishermen, the scientists, and the environmental community are actually working together for once, all pulling in the same direction. You talk to most fishermen, and the fish they have to release, they don't want them to die. They want yeah. them to live. There we go. There you go. The Smart Gear competition is a really successful model of uh, a conservation organization working with industry to address a problem. We're not looking to put anyone out of business, we're looking to help them address a problem that they're looking for solutions to. You know, if you can catch a fish and release it safely and they, get, they swim away, that bycatch will live to be caught another day. This is an alternative, which is much better than losing your favorite fishing area. The unusual body shape of a snake might seem like a disadvantage when compared to other creatures, but boas, pythons, and pit vipers have a secret weapon when it comes to identifying both predator and prey. As Miles O'Brien explains in our Science Nation report, they can sense danger and lunch, even with their eyes closed. Talk about a shot in the dark, but even with its vision blocked, this snake strikes its prey with pinpoint precision. This blindfolded snake can strike perfectly accurately based on its thermal sensation, its ability to detect warm objects in its environment. It is literally seeing heat. With support from the National Science Foundation, Florida tech biologist Michael Grace and his team carefully study these reptiles' infrared sensors. This ball python, like most boas and pythons, has an array of these infrared sensory organs called pit organs right around the mouth. So their brains have an image of the visible world and an image of the thermal world. So they see both light and heat together at the same time. Our ultimate goal is to understand the workings of the, the system so that maybe you could build better artificial devices. We could truly revolutionize the way infrared sensors are used in industrial applications or police purposes or military purposes. These snakes aren't just sharpshooters, they're smart too. They can be trained to use their thermal sense to make choices and get rewards. Grace wants to learn just how sensitive those heat sensing organs are. They can be trained to do very complex series of behaviors. In this experiment, kind of a game show for snakes, this Burmese python must pick a door based on whether or not it senses heat. This animal has been trained that when the thermal stimulus is on to choose the left 
push button and this animal has made the correct choice and it is now retrieving its dead mouse reward. Better understanding of these snakes' thermal sensing skills could help authorities manage them in places like the Everglades where they are an invasive species. We recognize this exotic mega predator as a tremendous ecological threat. This infrared imaging system is certainly part of the key to their success here in the subtropics. People demonize snakes, but I just love this animal. It sort of looks like a, a big puppy. A puppy? Well, handle with care. These little cuties may not bark, but they definitely bite. Here's a quick look at a story from our next show. I had no idea how close the mountains were to Los Angeles and how beautiful it was. We're so caught up with the city life that we forget that you need to have that balance between the outdoors and the city. And that's a nice way to recreate with your family or friends, maybe even a cheap date. Why not protect what is literally our backyard? Thanks for watching. And remember, you can catch us anytime at thisamericanland.org. We'd like to hear your comments and your ideas for stories you think we should cover. We'll see you next time. For more information about this program, visit thisamericanland.org. Funding for This American Land provided by the Weiss Foundation, the Pew Charitable Trust, and the Turner Foundation.